So if you'll turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll read the first eight verses. Uh, we may or may not cover all that. It was just going to be the first seven verses, but verse 8 is so wonderful, I wanted to include it too. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're picking up where Dave left off this past Sunday night. Um, you therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier is active, <clears throat> or no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Understand what I say, for the Lord will give you insight in everything. In verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, of the seed of David, according to my gospel. I wanted to read verse 8 because that is the whole reason why we gather here on a Wednesday night. When it's cold, when we walk in, we know the heat pump's not been on all day, and we crank it on knowing that it's still going to be cold when we leave here because it's not enough time to warm it up. It's because we come to worship the risen one. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. If he's not risen from the dead, there's no point in us showing up. There's no point because we are lost in our sins if he's not risen from the dead. Of the seed of David, if he's not of the seed of David, according to all those promises in the Old Testament, then we are still lost in our sins. <clears throat> this is according to my gospel. Well, it's not just Paul's gospel, but it is the gospel that saved Paul. It is the gospel that saved us who are in Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. But let's go back up to verse 1. You therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So you, who's you? He's talking to Timothy, right? He's calling him my child. You're my child in the faith. If we look back at verse 2 of chapter 1, he said to Timothy, my beloved child. He saw Timothy as his son in the faith. Because he had taught Timothy the gospel. He had raised him up in the faith. By the grace of God, through God's grace, he was called to be an elder here at Ephesus. And he had a strong bond, Timothy did, with Paul. He looked up to him. <clears throat> Hopefully, we all have somebody in our lives that we can look up to in the faith. That we can look to them and say, I was nurtured in my Christianity by that person. And hopefully also, we can say the opposite, that we are the Paul figure in somebody else's life. No matter what our level of maturity is. Just think, if you just became a Christian six months ago, there are Christians younger than you in the faith. You have learned things that you can teach them. You have learned wisdom that you can pass along to them. You have learned doctrine you can pass along to them. <clears throat> Therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say be strong in yourself. He doesn't be st say be strong in your own abilities. He says be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We are saved by grace through faith, right? Sola gratia, by grace alone. In Christ alone, solus Christus, be strong in the grace 
He is our fortress. He is the strong one. We are the weak one. We can't be strong apart from him, right? Verse 2. And the things which you have heard from me, going back to what we were talking about, Paul had taught Timothy sound doctrine. He had taught him about the Lord Jesus. He had taught him about the gospel. You have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He said, pass along what you've learned, Timothy. There are no doubt other elders here in Ephesus. <clears throat> and in that, Timothy is to train them up to be able to teach sound doctrine to other faithful men. Men so much that the grace of God is shown in their lives that they are called out to be elders, maybe some to be deacons, some to serve in other ways. But every church member is a servant. Every church member is a minister. Whether they're ministering at, in mercy ministry, maybe they have been given the spiritual gift of giving, maybe they are making shoes. I've used this illustration before. Luther was asked, how does a Christian make shoes? He said, well, it's not by putting little crosses on the shoes. He said, it's by making good shoes. It's doing things to the glory of God, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether it's milking a cow to the glory of God, making shoes to the glory of God, preaching a sermon to the glory of God, handing out a gospel tract to the glory of God, being in the Sigornsville Christmas Parade on Saturday to the glory of God. Not begrudgingly. We don't do things for Christ against what we desire to do. <clears throat> we do things because we have been shown so much grace. Because he is worthy to serve. He is worthy to worship. It's just, I think it was Spurgeon said, evangelism is just telling one beggar, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. We have found bread. We have found the bread of life. Jesus Christ. He satisfies us. Lamentations 3.24 The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. To be satisfied truly in Christ is to share that good news with others. In the presence of many witnesses, he says. What other witnesses? Everyone else who has ever been born again. Pastor Dave just preached out of Hebrews chapter 12 last week what did he say it says therefore since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us right so great a cloud of witnesses here for second timothy many witnesses every person who has ever been born again is a witness to the glory and to the grace in christ jesus entrust these things to faithful men entrusting the gospel to faithful men. There are many, many people around this world and throughout history who have perverted the gospel. They have twisted the gospel for their own personal gain, whether it's financial gain, whether it's clout in, in society, whatever it is. Maybe they're power hungry. But no, it's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. <clears throat> but teach these men, faithful men, so that they can teach others. Well, it must have worked, right? Because we know the gospel, right? If Paul had not taught the gospel to Timothy, and Timothy hadn't taught it to this person and this person and this person and this person and so forth well nobody would have bothered copying down the scriptures 
after the initial inspiration by the Holy Spirit, the canon was completed after the book of Revelation. The canon was completed. Those original copies we don't have anymore. But they made copy after copy after copy after copy after copy. Many different languages throughout 2,000 years of church history so that we have a Bible today. And we can see what they wrote and we can see it in our own language so that we can understand it. Why? Because the gospel works. The gospel transforms people's lives. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Timothy, he's both of those. He was half Jew, half Greek, right? His mother was a Jew, his father was a Gentile. <clears throat> Verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Suffering hardship. That is the Christian life. Suffering hardship. You think Paul, who's about to die here, knew anything about suffering hardship? There are many who would want to pervert the gospel by saying it's a gospel of glory. No, the glory is in Christ. We have a gospel of the cross. We have a gospel of suffering. We have a crucified Savior who is risen. Monday night, there were charlatans over in Johnson City preaching a false gospel. This prosperity gospel. Teaching that it's God's will always for you to be healed. It's God's will always for you to be rich. It's God's will always for you to float through life without a care, without a trouble. They're perverting the gospel. There's no hardship in their news. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that hardship will come. And for Paul, dying in a prison in Rome... He wasn't looking to his situation. He was looking to Christ. He was looking to the one who died in his place. Yeah, hardship comes. This is a sin-tainted world. This world is decaying. Constantly decaying. Ever since Adam disobeyed, God cursed the earth, and it is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Until what? until Christ comes back for his bride then he'll make all things new we have a theology of the cross that cross is the picture of our redemption but it's also a picture of what we are to go through as Christians suffering hardship with me Paul says as a good soldier of Christ Jesus this picture he uses as a soldier <clears throat> someone who goes to battle well we know it's not against flesh and blood right our battle is a spiritual battle we have been given spiritual weapons <clears throat> the promise of the Holy Spirit who came as an earnest for us as a as a promise, as the guarantee of what would come later. It's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. It's not against flesh and blood. There is no human on this planet that is our enemy. If they appear to be our enemy, they are only the mission field. They are deceived by the enemy. <clears throat> But they are not the enemy. They are the ones to whom we can proclaim the good news. Suffer hardship with me <clears throat> as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now verse 4, he goes on to talk about how a soldier is to behave. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. What happens? Somebody goes to war... They're not going home in the middle of the day to milk the cows. They're not going home in the middle of the day 
to harvest the corn. They're not going and digging potatoes in the middle of the day. No, they are completely sold out for the battle, for what their general has for them to do. There is no going home. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. What's a soldier do? He follows orders, right? If a soldier doesn't follow orders, what happens? He probably gets court-martialed, right? Dishonorably discharged. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen in Christ's army. Why? Because those whom he has enlisted, he has purchased. He has purchased with his own blood. So part of that sanctification process, because we have been justified, we follow the orders of the general. When we fail, we have an advocate with the Father, right? doesn't mean we stop trying to follow those orders, but it means we have a single mind when it comes to the things of God. That we are to follow Christ Jesus. We are to seek His glory. Why? To please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Verse 5. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete. So here's another analogy. We have the analogy of a soldier going to battle, not being distracted by the things of this life, but having the focus solely on the spiritual battle, solely on the glory of Christ, solely on our King and what he has commanded and what he has done. Now we move on. If anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, right? According to the rules. What rules? The rules of the race. If you're running a marathon, there were several years ago, this, uh, I can't remember if it was a woman or a man, but it was, I think, the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon, one of those. They found out that somebody cut corners. So it's supposed to be, what, 26.2 miles? I wouldn't know. I've never run one, but I've seen plenty of people bragging about it on stickers on the back of their cars. I think it's 26.2 miles. Well, this person won this marathon by cutting corners. Uh, if I remember correctly, and I could be misremembering this, but if I remember correctly, they even got in a car and rode part of the way. That's how they won this marathon. They didn't compete according to the rules, right? Christ has given his rules. So often we want to think that we have better rules than he does. Well, I know your word says this, but I'm going to do that. I know that you say the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but I really think a pizza party is a better way to draw people to Christ, not the gospel. And we could go on and on. The schemes of men are no way to win people to Christ. But guess what? People with good motives do things that are contrary to the word of God. And God despite their disobedience, still saves people. Why? By the preaching of the gospel. If we think we're to draw men by worldly means, we've said it before. I can stand up here, you can douse me with gasoline and set me on fire. It'll draw a show. It'll draw people to the building, right? But, that's not how God has told us to draw people to him. We draw people to him by proclaiming the gospel, handing out a gospel tract, by telling somebody the gospel, by preaching the good news. And it don't just happen here inside the church walls. Church worship services are for Christians. Why would a lost person want to come to a worship service? Maybe to see a spectacle. Maybe if I was going to light myself on fire Sunday, we might draw a crowd. We could post it all over social media. Preacher's going to light himself on fire Sunday. Come watch. Well, what are we going to do the next week to get him back again, right? 
We're going to have to light two people on fire. Gentry will have to stand up here, ride a unicycle while he's juggling, and then we'll light him on fire. But then what are we going to do the next week? we got to keep one up and then one up and then one up. And if we're going to draw people by worldly means, then we got to get it better next time. If we got a smoke machine this week, we got to have fireworks next week. According to the rules. That's how God has ordained it. The ordinary means. The pro- proclamation of the word. That is what draws men to Christ. Verse 6, we have another analogy. Another illustration from Paul. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. What's that mean? It means that the preacher is worthy of his wages. That's what the Bible says. It would be nothing would make me happier than for us to be able to fully support Dave to be a full time pastor. Why? Because then he can devote all of his time to study in the Word and to prayer. That is why full time pastors exist, so they can devote their time to the Word and to prayer. <clears throat> The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. The fruit of preaching the word is that God is glorified. Sometimes we want to flip-flop it. The primary reason is that God is glorified. Let's look at the first catechism question in our catechism book. I don't have to read it, but I'm going to. I hope we all got number one memorized here. What is the chief end of man? In this version, it says, what is the main reason a person exists? Gentry asked me not to call on him, so I won't. What is the main reason a person exists? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Our primary reason is to be here to glorify God. Many people think evangelism is the primary reason we're here. Evangelism is a fruit of glorifying God. We proclaim the gospel to glorify God. What he does with the results, it's up to him. It's up to the Holy Spirit to convict sinners of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But our role is to play according to the rules, to reap the fruit of the harvest according to the way God has told us to do it. We proclaim the gospel. He brings the fruit. Right? Verse 7. Understand what I say. For the Lord will give you insight in everything. So many times we can think, oh, well, then that just means I can study the word for myself and God will illuminate it through the Holy Spirit. Well, and sometimes that does happen. But guess what? We've had 2,000 years of Christians reading the word. 2,000 years of people being taught by the Holy Spirit, just like us. We're not to read our Bible as if we're the first person to ever read it. Because what? We're still in a sin-stained world. We're we're still in this world that has been cursed by God. Our bodies, which includes our brains and our understanding, are still under that curse until Christ makes all things new. So, yes, God will give us understanding. He will give us insight. He will make us understand things but because we are still under the curse here in our flesh because our brains don't work right we can lean on each other I mean, why did we meet here this past Saturday to go through a book written by John Owen because John Owen was wonderfully gifted by God with understanding we're leaning on him Why do we come and listen to teaching on Wednesday night? 
because we're to lean on those whom God has given an extra amount of understanding. Why does Dave get up here on Sunday morning and preach and not just read the text? Because God has gifted Dave to be a teacher and to be a preacher. He's commanded teaching and preaching to be part of the worship service. But he's given Christians different giftings. So we can lean on each other as we're each leaning on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us insight. Yes. Well, what if you have two Christians, and I know this would never happen, they read the same passage, and they come to two different conclusions. That could never happen, right? If the same Holy Spirit is the teacher of both, both are born again, yet they come to two different conclusions. Why? Because we, in this world, this world has still been affected by the curse. So, to come to two different conclusions, two men, both gifted by God to teach, we see this all the time. We have our favorite theologians that we read and that we listen to, if we don't, then we're our own favorite theologian. And be very dangerous. It's a very dangerous world to live in when you're your own favorite theologian. Know that we can read the scriptures with 2,000 years of church history because that's 2,000 years of Christ's power being displayed in the lives of ordinary, sinful human beings. That is how we can receive understanding. Yes, read the Word. Yes, study the Word for yourself. But don't be afraid to lean on someone who has been gifted with a greater amount of understanding than you. And then, here we are, back to verse 8 where we started. We'll read this one, and then I think we'll finish. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, of the seed of David, according to my gospel and I already mentioned this a little bit at the beginning but we'll just cover this verse remember Jesus Christ that's all we have that's all we need is Jesus Christ and him crucified the God man who is Jesus Christ he's God he's man he's our mediator he's our redeemer He's the second member of the Trinity. He is the one who was displayed publicly on a cross as a substitute for everyone who would ever be born again. For everyone who would ever trust in him, he bore our sins. <clears throat> and what's it say? He rose from the dead. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. If he's not risen, we got no hope of the seed of David. That promise of a king, an eternal king. David, as good a king as he was, was still a sinful, sinful man. Jesus Christ is the better David. Jesus is the better king. According to my gospel, my gospel not that it's a different gospel. It's what he told the Galatians, right? Let's look over in Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. It's a recurring theme in Paul's writings, making sure that the first thing is first, that the most important thing is on display, Jesus Christ, who was risen from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, right, that substitute, substitutionary atonement, so that he might rescue us. Who does he rescue? 
everyone who would ever trust in him, everyone whom the Father chose from before the foundation of the world, from this present evil age. That's what we've been talking about. This spiritual warfare we have. This We have a theology of suffering, a theology of the cross. This present evil age. This world that hates God. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So over in 2 Timothy, we see Paul talking about my gospel. Here he's talking about a different gospel. Verse 7, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of God. Christ, the gospel of Christ, that he was what? Born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died a substitutionary death on the cross, that he was really buried because he was really dead and he really rose again and he really ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's really coming back again. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. The gospel that Paul is talking about, my gospel, in verse 8, is the same one he preached in Galatia that made them born again. It's the same one that he preached in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. When you run into anybody that professes to be a Christian, maybe they're in one of the cults, ask them what their good news is. If their news is is about work, 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 work. They got no good news. Because if I'm saved one iota by what I do, I fail. If your gospel is love God and love people, you're damned. Because you haven't perfectly loved God. And you haven't perfectly loved people. If your gospel is about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom... Let them know. The scriptures say it's about Jesus Christ. Him crucified and Him buried and Him risen. Make sure we know the gospel. That it's Jesus Christ crucified. Risen from the dead. That is the gospel. What He has done. The person and work of Jesus. The second member of the Godhead. Truly God. Truly man. Our mediator. Our redeemer. We have a theology of the cross, of suffering. And one day we will see in glory with our eyes what we now only see by faith. Let's pray. Father, you are so kind to give us your word, to illuminate it by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you've allowed us this time to study and to learn. May you bless our time that we've had. May you bless those that weren't able to attend tonight. And may you receive all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.